All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at a new sutta. Uh, as you know, if you've been coming, we've been making our way through the Majima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses, and we've made it to sutta number 51. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at the Kandaraka Sutta. Kandaraka is the name of a person. And so this is the sutta that was given to Kandaraka. Um, so this sutta is going to be a fun one for us tonight. Mm. Excuse me. Because, thank you, Tia. So I mentioned this, I think, like last week, but... If you know about this collection, you'll know that it's about 150 suttas, 150 teachings of the Buddha, and they're divided into 50 suttas, 50 suttas, 50 suttas. So those are the three divisions. And we are on the second division. And this is the group, or at least the beginning of this, is a group of suttas that are for householders. Now, we've we've read a few suttas recently that are for householders, but they were sort of uh, coincidentally, I would say, that they were for householders. But tonight we're going to read a sutta that's sort of like very specifically about householder dharma in a way. It's going to be about non- Householder Dharma too, so it's, it'll be interesting to kind of contrast the two in that way. Um, so, actually, I'll mention this too, really quickly. So you may know, I've been teaching Dharma Doors now for San Francisco Dharma Collective for many years, and there was a time when we didn't record these. There was a time when we didn't do the whole YouTube thing and all of that, and so. Actually, I've been I was looking at my notes for this sutta, and I think I taught this sutta years ago at the center, maybe, but of course it's been lost now to time in that way. Um, so we're gonna maybe re be revisiting this. It's a really great sutta, by the way. I, I know I say that about all the suttas, but this is one of those ones that where it's like it's kind of got everything in that way. <clears throat> so let's dive into it. I don't know if we'll get through the whole thing. This might be a part one, part two thing. Um, yeah, it depends. But let's dive in. Um, so again, this is the Kandaraka Sutta, the Sutta to Kandaraka, who we'll meet in a moment. <clears throat> and here it goes. Uh, Starts like a classic sutta, of course. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Buddha, the Blessed One, was living at Champa on the banks of the Gagara Lake with a large sangha of bhikkhus. Then Pesa, the elephant driver's son, and Kandaraka, the wanderer, they went to the Blessed One. Pesa, the elephant tamer or elephant driver's son, after paying homage to the Blessed One, sat down to one side, while Kandaraka exchanged greetings with the Blessed One. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side. Standing there, he surveyed the Sangha of bhikkhus, sitting in complete silence. And then he said to the Blessed One, It's wonderful, Master Gotama. It's marvelous how the Sangha of bhikkhus <clears throat> has been led to practice the right way by you, Master Gotama. Those who were Blessed Ones accomplished and fully enlightened in the past, at most only led the Sangha of bhikkhus to practice the right way, as is done by the Master Gotama now. 
And those who will be blessed ones, accomplished and fully enlightened in the future, at most, they will only lead the Sangha of Bhikkhus to practice the right way, as is done by Master Gotama now. So it is, Kandaraka, so it is. This is the Buddha speaking now. Those who were blessed ones, accomplished and fully enlightened in the past, at most, only led the Sangha of Bhikkhus to practice the right way, as is done by me now. And those who will be blessed ones, accomplished and fully enlightened in the future, at most, will only lead the Sangha of Bhikkhus to practice the right way, as is done by me now. All right. Let's pause really quickly just to kind of focus our attention. So a little backstory. Um, if you have this edition, you can read this in the footnotes. So this is interesting because one of these guys, uh, Pessa, Pessa, the elephant tamer son. So Pessa is a, a, a white robed lay Buddhist. So he's a householder Buddhist. But uh, Kandaraka is not a Buddhist. He is a wandering ascetic. He's kind of, you know, uh, uh, walking to the beat of his own drum, so to speak. Um, he is known as a clothed ascetic versus a, a naked ascetic, which was common, but he's one of the clothed wanderers in that way. But it's important to note that he's not a Buddhist. So those are our two characters. Those are our, our audience. And just in case you didn't quite get what was conveyed, both of these people, but in particular, uh, Pessa, Pessa's really impressed by the Sangha. And in particular, he's very impressed by how they're just all sitting there in complete silence. And I will mention, there's a, a number of suttas where this happens. There's a famous sutta, I forget what the name of it is. It might be the fruits of the homeless life, the Samanapala sutta, but, but there's a sutta where a king, I believe it's King Ajatashatru, but he comes to see the Buddha and he actually gets like freaked out because everybody's so quiet that, you know, the Buddha's just sitting there kind of at the middle and everybody's just totally quiet. So this is a theme that we find that often when people go to see the Buddha and the Sangha, they're often very impressed that nobody's you know, chattering or this and that, that they're just all sitting there perfectly silent. So that's what they're impressed by. And what, um, uh, what Kandaraka says when he says, wow, it's wonderful, Master Gotama. It's marvelous. All the enlightened people of the past, the like the best that they did was what you are doing to, you know, have such peaceful, uh, uh, such a peaceful sangha. And any future Buddha, any future enlightened one, if they succeed, then at most, they're going to have a sangha like yours. All right. So that's sort of what was said at the beginning, that it's very impressive how all of you are so tamed and I, I say that because I want you to know that that's where this kind of sutta is going. And it's why I'm focusing on this idea that they're very impressed by the stillness of the Sangha. Now, the Buddha says, yep, that's right. <laughs> any enlightened person in the past, any enlightened person in the future, at most, if they're good, they're going to accomplish what I've accomplished in that way. And then the Buddha goes on to say, and the reason why that is, Kandaraka, in this Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who are arahats, with taints destroyed, who've lived the holy life, 
done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and who are completely liberated through final knowledge. Now, regarding those, those ideas that were just listed, ideas about an arhat having destroyed the taints, many, many months ago, we did a whole sutra on what it means to destroy the taints and to be an arhat. So these people have done that. And then this language about doing what had to be done and putting down the burden, reaching the true goal, destroying the fetters of being, these are all ideas that we've spoken about in the past regarding what constitutes sort of liberation in Buddhism. So putting down the burden of attachment, specifically attachment to the aggregates, the attachment to the idea of a self. So, uh, yeah, completely liberated through final knowledge. So some of the people in the Sangha are arahats. And in this Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus in higher training of constant virtue, living a life of constant virtue, sagacious, living a life of constant sagacity. They abide with their minds well established in the four foundations of mindfulness. What four? Here, Kandaraka. A bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as the body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. They abide contemplating vedana sensations as sensations. Ardent and fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. They abide contemplating chitta, mind states, as mind states. Ardent and fully aware, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. And they abide contemplating dharmas, mind objects, as mind objects. Ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness, grief, and grief for the world. All right, so really quickly, maybe not quickly, I don't know, depends on if there's questions, but this has all of a sudden become a sutta about the four foundations of mindfulness. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page regarding the four foundations of mindfulness. Just a quick review can never hurt. And then we'll kind of keep going. But so the Buddha basically says like, yeah, this Sangha, they're very still, they're very quiet because a lot of them are arhats who have put down the burden, destroyed the taints and all of that. And most of them are in higher learning and they cultivate the four foundations of mindfulness. That's why they're so still. That's why they're still quiet. That's why they're so calm. And so just really quickly again, the four foundations of mindfulness is the Buddhist meditation technique. <laughs> There's no other. <laughs> this is it. This is the basis of all other meditation techniques, I should say. And what the technique is, is that it's about establishing mindfulness, which is to say focusing one's attention on the body. <laughs> That's the first foundation of mindfulness, is to bring your attention to the embodied experience of having a body and become aware. And in other words, don't have your mind over there, don't have your mind over there, don't have your mind in the past, don't have your mind in the future, have your mind focused on the body. And that's the first foundation of mindfulness. It's sort of like reigning in the mind and making yourself aware of the body. And then once your mindfulness is established on the body, you can kind of focus your attention on the body. 
but you're focusing your attention on the sensations. So this is the second foundation of mindfulness, where you're focusing your attention on the sensations, the vedana, that are arising from the body. So we have not lost focus of the body. We are just tightening the focus so that we are now becoming aware of the senses. And in particular, we're being aware of sensations I like and that that feel good, sensations that I don't like and that they feel bad, or just neutral sensations where I don't really feel one way or the other about them. And so I'm being mindful of the body but in the second foundation, I'm being mindful of the way my body feels and the way I'm reacting to the body. So again, still the body, but the sens sensations arising from the body. And then once you're fully established with mindfulness on sensations, you can tighten the focus even more by bringing your attention to your very state of mind understanding that this state of mind you're in at this very moment is arising due to the senses of your body that include eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain. So that's what I want to point out in terms of this mental activity that is arising based upon what you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking about at any given moment. And you can focus your attention on that state of mind and realize that if you're kind of angry right now, you might be able to attribute it to a negative sensation you're having of your body. So now we're at the third foundation of mindfulness, focusing on the very state of mind I'm in at this very moment. And then I could tighten the focus of that meditation even more to focus on the very ideas that mind is having at every moment. And you're focusing on those ideas, those dharmas they're called, these mind objects. And those are the four foundations of mindfulness that are used to establish or used to bring about shamatha, that calm, peaceful state. That's the method for doing it. That's the method for reigning in the mind. Focus on your body, then the sensations, then the state of mind arising from them, the sensations, and then the very thoughts of that mind having arisen from the sensations of the body. Now, that's our quick review of the four foundations of mindfulness. And that's why the group of Sangha is so still and calm. But when this was said, Pesa, the elephant driver's son, remember, he's a lay Buddhist. He said, it's wonderful, venerable sir. It's marvelous how well the four foundations of mindfulness have been made known by the Blessed One for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of nirvana. For, venerable sir, we white-clothed lay people also from time to time abide with our minds well established in these four foundations of mindfulness. Here, venerable sir, we too abide contemplating the body as the body. We too contemplate sensations as sensations. We too contemplate the mind as the mind, and we too contemplate mind objects as mind objects. Ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. It's wonderful, venerable sir. It's marvelous. How amid man's tangle, man's corruption and deceptions, the Blessed One knows the welfare and harm of beings. For humankind is in a tangle. But the animal, 
is open enough. Venerable sir, I can drive an elephant in, and make it tamed. And in the time it takes to take a trip back and forth to the city of Champa, that elephant will show every kind of deception, duplicity, crookedness, and fraud that he's capable of. But those who are called our slaves, our messengers and servants, they behave in one way with the body, in another way with speech, <clears throat> while their minds work in still yet a whole other way. It's wonderful, venerable sir. It's marvelous how amid man's tangle, corruption, and deceptions, the Blessed One knows the welfare and harm of beings. For humankind is in a tangle, but the animal is open enough. All right, let's pause there because this is actually the kind of the essence of the sutta, this little discourse right here. So let's remember that this, this guy Pessa is an elephant trainer, elephant tamer, elephant driver, right? So he works with elephants. And if you didn't catch it, because I know the language is a little weird. Oh, actually, let me back up for a second. Before we talk about the elephant and this idea of the animals being open enough, I want to focus really quickly on one important line. It's the line when it comes to the four foundations of mindfulness. And each of those four foundations, starting with the body, it says that the, the meditator, the practitioner, is mindful, ardent, fully aware, fo right, focusing on, say, the body, for example. And then there's this line, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I just wanted to emphasize really quickly that in the practice of this, these four foundations of mindfulness, so when you're going for shamatha, when you're going for that calm state, part of the withdrawal, like part of that seclusion and that withdrawal of the meditative state, I know that we spend a lot of our time talking about reigning in desire like reigning in the wanting and the craving of the world and that it's kind of going to be difficult to establish a calm mind state if you're in a covetous relationship with the world, like wanting things. But I just want to point out that there's also a problem with, in a way, fretting and worrying about the world. So it kind of cuts two ways in that sense. And I don't want to make this sound, and I don't want to make this sound like this is about, you know, sweeping anything under the rug or ignoring any problems. It's not about that. It's about if I've decided to take this 30 minute period or this 45 minute period, if I've decided to take this period of time to calm down and meditate, the idea is, is that there's nothing for me to do right now about the world. Even the world might be in a terrible place, needing lots of assistance in that way. But what I'm recognizing right now is that if I were to take 30 minutes out of time, calm my mind down, that would actually be good for me and the world. And so I'm going to take this 30 minutes to do that. And that's going to require both not being covetously desireful of the world, but also not fretting and worrying about the world. Just let the world be, as it were. So I just want to point that out as an aspect of the, of the foundations of mindfulness. It's about coming into that mindfulness of the body and really just allowing everything else to subside in that way. Okay, now let's get back to Pessa, the elephant trainer. So there's this interesting thing going on here. So first he says, hey, 
we we lay people we householder we we do meditation too sometimes that's good to to notice and then he says this thing about humankind being in a tangle right for humankind is in a tangle but the animal he says is open enough what what does he mean by that right well he gives an example of what he means by the animal is open enough. He's basically kind of saying like animals are easy to train, but if you kind of let them go on their own, they will easily kind of devolve. And, and like these elephants in the time it takes to just get back and forth to the city, right? They will demonstrate every kind of deception, duplicity, crookedness, and fraud. But he's basically saying that, but animals are sort of like pretty basic that way. The human though, the humankind, what does he say? He says these humans though, they behave one way with the body, a whole other way with their speech, while their minds work in still another way. So that's the tangle that the human is in. And the way that I read this, and if you, again, if you read uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli, if you read their footnotes, they read it this way too, which is basically saying that he, the human condition is nothing compared to the animal condition in terms of the human's ability to get themselves in a total mess of a knot in that way. With this idea that these humans are doing one thing with their body, saying one thing with their mouth, and thinking one thing with their mind. If you didn't kind of catch it, of course, the what they're implying or what they're saying is that to be doing one thing with your body, another thing with your speech, and a whole other thing with your mind, that is not mindfulness. That's not to be focused, gathered together in that way. So we kind of now begin to understand what they're talking about or why they're talking about the foundations of mindfulness and elephant taming. <laughs> well, the basic idea, if I can just sort of fill in the blanks, you know, one of the titles of a Buddha, of an enlightened being in this tradition, is a human tamer which is a funny kind of title for a Buddha, right? We have uh, elephant tamers, lion tamers. Well, the Buddha is a human tamer. The idea being that we humans are out of control and don't even know how to control ourselves in that way. Luckily, the Buddha came along, taught the four foundations of mindfulness as the technique for calming down and reining in the tangled mind in that way. So, any questions about the four foundations of mindfulness then before we move forward? Just want to make sure everybody's on the same page about that. Cool. All right, let's go. There's a really funny part about this sutta coming up, but let's get to the, the more um, substantive part of this because this has sort of been a big buildup. Like, what's this sutta about? Mind taming. And so after the Buddha, or after I should say the, the elephant tamer Pesa, after he says all of that, the Buddha replies saying, this is a paragraph or section five. So it is Pesa. So it is. Humankind is in a tangle, but the animal is open enough. Pesa. There are four kinds of people to be found existing in the world. What four? Here, a certain kind of person torments themselves and pursues the practice of tormenting themselves. Here, a certain kind of person torments others and they pursue the practice of torturing others. Here, a certain kind of person torments themselves and pursues the practice of tormenting themselves and also torments others 
and pursues the practice of torturing others. And here, a certain person or a certain kind of person does not torment themselves, does not pursue the practice of torturing themselves. And they do and they do not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others. Since that person torments neither themselves nor others, they are here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, and they abide experiencing bliss, having themselves become holy or divine. Which of these four kinds of persons satisfies your mind, Pessa? The first three do not satisfy my mind, he says, venerable sir. But the last one satisfies my mind. Venerable sir, the kind of person who torments themselves and pursues the practice of torturing themselves, torments and tortures themselves, though they desire pleasure, and they recoil from pain. That is why that kind of person doesn't satisfy my mind. And the kind of person who torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others, well, they torment and torture others who desire pleasure and recoil from pain. That's why that kind of person doesn't satisfy my mind. And the kind of person who torments themselves and pursues the practice of torturing themselves and who also torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others, torments and tortures himself and others, both of whom desire pleasure and recoil from pain, that's why this kind of person does not satisfy my mind. But the kind of person who does not torment themselves or pursue the torture of others, and who does not, does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others, who, since they torment neither themselves nor others, are here and now hungerless, extinguished and cool, and they abide and experience bliss, having themselves become divine, they do not torment and torture either themselves or others, both of whom desire pleasure and recoil from pain. That's why that kind of person satisfies my mind. And now, venerable sir, we depart. <laughs> We're busy and we have a lot to do. And the Buddha says, you may go, Pessa, at your own convenience. Then Pessa, the elephant driver's son, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right side, he departed. Soon after he had left, the Blessed One addressed all the bhikkhus saying, Bhikkhus, Pessa, the elephant driver's son, he's wise. He has great wisdom. If he'd stayed a little bit longer until I'd expounded for him in detail these four kinds of people, he would have been greatly benefited. Still, he has already greatly benefited, even as it is. And then, of course, all the Bhikkhus, ch they chant, this is the time, blessed one. This is the time, sublime one. This is the time for the blessed one to expound in detail these four kinds of people. Having heard it from the blessed one, the bhikkhus will remember it. All right. So just this is where I want to point out. This is where we have this division between the householder dharma and then the kind of renunciant bhikkhu dharma in that way. So I want to kind of make it clear. I just want to reinforce, you know, so the Buddha says 
there's these four kinds of people, right? People that torture themselves, people that torture others, people that torture themselves and others, and people that don't torture themselves or others and just are cooled and have bliss. And it's kind of like, you don't even really need to hear much more than, than that idea. You can, you can imagine, I know that you can imagine what it means to torture yourself and torment yourself. I know, I know I can. I can imagine what it means to torment and torture others in that way. And I can imagine what it would mean to do it to self and other. So we have to kind of just hear this kind of uh, householder Dharma level where the Buddha has kind of said, but there's this other way of not torturing yourself or others. And that that's the state of being divine. And it's sort of like, well, if you put it that way, I really like the sound of that fourth one. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But then we get this funny part where he says, but we're really busy. We've got a lot to do. Now, again, it's not that the Buddha is saying, you know, that that's a bad thing exactly. He's saying, no, he's really smart. And even hearing what he heard was beneficial but not as beneficial if he had stuck around a little bit longer to hear the whole teaching in that way. So let's find out what the whole teaching is. So let's see. Then bhikkhus listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. And the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, what kind of person torments themselves and pursues the practice of torturing themselves? Here, a certain person goes naked, rejecting conventions, licking his hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked, it's someone who does not accept food brought to them or food especially made for them or any invitation to a meal. It's someone who doesn't receive anything from a pot or from a bowl or from across a threshold or from the end of a stick or across a pestle. It's somebody who doesn't receive food from two people eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman suckling a child, from a woman in the around that's hanging around men from where food is advertised to be distributed from where a dog is waiting from where flies are buzzing it's what it means to torture oneself and practice the torture of oneself means to not accept fish or meat to drink no liquor no wine or fermented brew it's just to keep to one house and to one morsel meaning begging from just one house and getting just one morsel. Or it means two houses and two morsels or up to seven houses and seven morsels. It's, a, it's someone who lives on just one saucer full of food a day or two saucer fulls up to seven saucer fulls of food. It's someone who takes food once a day or once every two days or once every seven days thus even up to taking food only once every two weeks. It's someone dwelling, pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals, so a certain kind of fasting. It's someone who's an eater of greens or millet or wild rice or hide pairings or moss or rice bran or rice scum or cesium flour or grass or cow dung. <laughs> it's someone who lives on forest roots and fruits or fallen fruits. It's someone who's clo who clothes themselves in hemp, in hemp mixed cloth, or in shrouds, or refuse rags, or tree bark, or antelope skins, or antelope hides, or kusa grass fabric, or bark fabric, wood shavings fabric, in head hair wool, in animal wool, in owl's wings. It's someone who pulls out their own hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out their hair and beard. 
It's one who stands continuously rejecting seats or one who squats continuously devoted to maintaining the squatting position. It's one who uses a, uses a mattress of spikes, making a mattress of spikes their bed. It's one dwelling pursuing the practice of bathing in water, presumably very cold water, three times a day, including the evening. Thus, in such a variety of ways, it's one who dwells pursuing the practice of tormenting and mortifying the body. This is called the kind of person who torments themselves and who pursues the practice of torturing themselves. All right, so that's a, if we've read that once before, that's like a stock paragraph of, of the austerities, as they're called. I believe they're called the Dahuta practices. Dahuta is like austerities. Again, it's a classic stock paragraph that the Buddha originally mentioned in terms of the austerities he practiced before deciding that that was not the way. So, so that's what it means to, to torment or torture oneself and to practice that. So austerity, for lack of a better term. And what kind of a person bhikkhus torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others? Here, a certain person is a butcher of sheep, a butcher of pigs, a butcher of fowl, a trapper of wild beasts, a hunter, a fisherman, a thief, an executioner, a prison warden, or one who follows any other such bloody occupation. This is called the kind of person who torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. Now, this third one is going to be interesting. So it's this kind of person who torments both themselves and others. And just to let you know, going into this, and I do want to kind of read this because it's very interesting. This is the a really interesting description of the practice of a Brahmin. So we are often hearing about these Brahmins. Um, they pop up a lot in the suttas. If you've studied Indian religion at all, you know about Brahmanism in that way, the, the priestly caste. Well, this is an example, or it seems to be a very clear example of what a Brahmin priest at the time of the Buddha was involved in doing, or at least certain types of them. So what kind of a person bhikkhus torments themselves and pursues the practice of tormenting, torturing themselves and also torments others and pursues the practice of tormenting others? Here, someone is a head-anointed noble king or a well-to-do Brahmin. Having had a new sacrificial temple built to the east of the city, and having shaved off his hair and beard, dressed himself in rough, coarse hide, and greased his body with ghee and oil, scratching his back with a deer's horn, he enters the sacrificial temple together with his chief queen and his Brahmin high priest. There, the king lies down on the bare ground strewn with grass. The king lives on the milk in the first teat of a cow with a calf of the same color, while his chief queen lives on the milk of the second teat, and the Brahmin, the high priest, lives off the milk of the third teat, and the milk in the fourth teat they pour into the ritual fire. And the calf lives on whatever is left over. He says thus, Let so many bulls be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many bullocks be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many heifers be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many goats be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many sheep be slaughtered for sacrifice. Let so many trees be felled for sacrificial posts. 
Let so much grass be cut for the sacrificial grass. And then his slaves, messengers, and servants make preparations, weeping with tearful faces, being spurred on by threats of punishment and by fear. This is called the kind of person who torments themselves and pursues the practice of torturing themselves, and who torments others and pursues the practice of torturing others. All right. So those are our three, our first three types of people that have now been defined as the ascetic in that way, the butcher or anybody that's involved in blood bloodshed as their kind of occupation in that sense. And then the third is this interesting role of a Brahmin priest who's in the business of performing certain austerities on themselves and then inflicting a bunch of violence on animals, sacrificing them all for what you know, a new temple to basically dedicate a new temple. A bunch of torment and torture on oneself and others to dedicate a new temple. The Buddha's not into it in that way. So, and and by the way, just if you didn't, I, I, I know that you knew this, but I'd like to kind of point it out. You know, this, um, this is kind of, again, very radical in terms of if you, if you study history and look back 500 BC, time of the Buddha in India, the idea of somebody coming along and saying, your animal sacrifices aren't doing anything. In fact, it's just bad karma. <laughs> That's radical, actually, because animal sacrifice is like, has, you know, obviously a long time ago used to be a very big part of a lot of religious activity all over the world. It's still a part of certain religious activity in the world today. Christianity is sometimes like lauded at, in a way as being a form of kind of Judaism that moved against blood sacrifice. There's actually a way in which you can interpret or read the whole Eucharist thing where Jesus is like, this is my blood. This is my body. You can just eat bread and drink wine. You don't need to kill anybody anymore. Like there is a whole kind of way of reading Christianity as it being a new form of Judaism where we don't have to murder animals or that God doesn't want us to do that anymore. Just pointing out that Buddhism is a similar kind of, has a similar tendency where it's moving away from some very old established religious activity in that way. So, all right. Any questions about the three kind of so-called uh, wrong paths in that way? Are you okay with those definitions in that way of? So at this point, you got to be pretty curious then about the fourth type of person, right? So what kind of a person bhikkhus does not torment themselves or pursue the practice of torturing themselves? and does not torment others or pursue the practice of tormenting others. The one who, since they torment neither themselves nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled, and abides experiencing bliss, having themselves become holy or divine. <laughs> I, real, before I read this part, I want to emphasize one thing about this. It, it came up in a sutra a few weeks ago. It's come up in other sutras. I would love to just emphasize it. It's that it's that idea about the about the Dharma, about Buddha Dharma, about Buddhism, that what they're promising or suggesting in that way, it's the idea that what they're talking about is realizable here and now. And that it's not a mystery why it, it's possible. It's not a mystery. What, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea that it's here and now, right? And I just want to kind of emphasize really quickly that idea. I've used this example before, but just really quickly, I want to point it out. 
the example I've given before is about sort of like ideas of being like attached to, to my stuff, attached of my, to my cup. And the example I've given is, is that when I'm emotionally or otherwise attached to the cup, if somebody comes along and grabs it and runs away with it, it's going to cause suffering. It's going to cause stress, anxiety, anger, probably like all of these emotions, right? And there's one way of thinking, which is, ah, they took my cup. If they gave it back to me, though, I would be happy again because I would have my cup back and the cup is my source of joy. So I'll just wait until they bring it back. In other words, I can't be happy until they bring it back, right? All right, that's one way to restore happiness, right? But what's interesting is there's another way, which is if I'm not attached to the cup at all and they come and grab it, I'm already over it. And it's right here, right now. And that was based on something I did or didn't do. Not waiting for them to bring my cup back. And so the idea is, is that kind of on a spiritual level in that way, there's a way that we're waiting for the big bliss payoff. Like this will be it. If I scroll one more time, whatever image is going to pop up next, that's going to be the one that's going to fully satisfy me. Oh, maybe it's the next image. <laughs> oh, maybe it's the next. So if we're waiting for the bliss to come from outside, we'll be waiting for kalpas. Whereas this teaching of relinquishment in that way, it's immediate. It, it, it brings immediate coolness in that sense. So I just want to emphasize, it's, it's why I'm kind of always promoting the Dharma in that way, because I believe so much in that idea of it's realizable here and now. Okay, so for the pretty much the rest of the time, we're going to find out about the path of not torturing oneself or others. So this is, if you happen to have this version of it, this is starting at section or paragraph 12. And what I want you to know is, is that I've used, I've taught this sutra before, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I use this sutra a lot when I teach because starting here at uh, paragraph 12 and then all the way to the end of the sutta, this is one of the clearest descriptions of the path from the initial like uh like whoa wait there's a way not to suffer <laughs> all the way to the end so because of time and because we have read a lot of this before i'm probably not going to read it verbatim because again there are a lot of like these stock sections that we've heard before so i might kind of paraphrase those but I want you to hear the beginning in full because it's just so beautiful. So this is what it means to be that fourth type of person. The Buddha says, here bhikkhus, a tathagata appears in the world, a Buddha appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of people to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened one, blessed one. That Buddha declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmans, this generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes and its people, which he himself has realized through direct knowledge. 
He teaches the Dharma. Good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. And he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder, or the son or daughter of a householder, or one born in some other clan, hears the Dharma. On hearing the Dharma, they acquire faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, they consider thus. Household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It's not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on a yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Upon a later occasion, abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, they shave off their hair and beard, put on yellow robes, and they go forth from the home life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu's training and the bhikkhu's way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, they abstain from killing beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, they abide compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what has not been given, they abstain from taking what has not been given, taking only what has been given, accepting only what has been given. By not stealing, they abide in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, they observe celibacy, living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, they abstain from false speech. They speak the truth, adhere to the truth. They're trustworthy, reliable. One who is not a deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech. They abstain from malicious speech. They do not repeat elsewhere what they've heard here in order to, to divide these people from these people. Nor is it someone who repeats to these people what they've heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those people. Thus, they are one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, one who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, is a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, they abstain from harsh speech. They speak words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, that go to the heart as courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, they abstain from gossip. They speak at the right time. They speak what is fact, speak what is good. They speak on the Dharma and the discipline. They speak at the right time and they speak such words that are worth recording, are reasonable, moderate and beneficial. They abstain from injuring seeds and plants. They practice eating only one meal a day, abstaining from eating at night and outside of the proper time. They abstain from dancing, singing music and theatrical shows. They abstain from wearing garlands, from smartening themselves with scents and embellishing themselves with unguents. They abstain from high and large couches and beds. They abstain from accepting or even touching gold and silver. They abstain from accepting raw grain and other raw food. They abstain from accepting raw meat. They abstain from accepting women and girls. They abstain from accepting men and women slaves. They abstain from accepting goats and sheep. They abstain from accepting fowl and pigs. They abstain from accepting elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. They abstain from accepting fields and land. 
They abstain from going on errands for people and running messages. They abstain from buying and selling. They abstain from using false weights, false metals, and false measures. They abstain from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. They abstain from wounding, murdering, binding, looting, plunder, and violence. They become content with a robe to protect their body and with alms food begged from others to maintain their stomach. And wherever they go, they set out taking only those things with them. Just like a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. So too a bhikkhu becomes content with just robes to protect the body and with alms food to maintain the stomach. And wherever they go, they set out taking only these things. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, they experience within themselves a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, they do not grasp at its major characteristics and secondary features. Since if they left the eye faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade them. They practice the way of restraint. They guard the eye faculty. They undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, they do not grasp at its major characteristics and secondary signs, because if they left the ear unguarded, unwholesome states would arise. Also on smelling odors with the nose or tasting flavors with the tongue or touching tangible objects with the body or cognizing dharmas, mental objects with the mind. They do not grasp at their major characteristics and secondary features. Since if they left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade them. They practice the way of restraint. They guard the mind faculty. They undertake the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the sense faculties, they experience within themselves a bliss that is unsullied. Based upon that restraint of the sense faculties, they become one who acts in full awareness of their body when going forward and returning. One who acts in full awareness of the body when looking ahead and looking away. One who acts in full bodily awareness when flexing and extending their limbs. One who acts in full bodily awareness when wearing robes and carrying their outer robes in bowl. One who acts in full body awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food, and tasting. Who acts in full bodily awareness when defecating and urinating. Who acts in full bodily awareness when walking, standing, sitting, lying down, waking up, talking, or being silent. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue and this noble restraint of the sense faculties and possessing this noble mindfulness and full bodily awareness. With those three things in place, they resort to a secluded resting place the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, or a heap of straw. On returning from an alms round, after a meal, they sit down, folding the legs crosswise, sitting with body erect, and establishing mindfulness before them, abandoning covetousness for the world, one abides with a mind free of covetousness. They purify the mind 
of covetousness, abandoning ill will and anger. They abide with a mind free of ill will and anger, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. They purify the mind of ill will and hatred, abandoning sloth and torpor, or just laziness. They abide free from laziness, sloth, and torpor, percipient of light, mindful and fully aware. They purify the mind from sloth and torpor, abandoning restlessness and worry and anxiety and remorse. They abide unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. They purify the mind of restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt. They abide having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. They purify the mind of doubt. Having thus abandoned the five nivaranya, those five obstructions or five hindrances, those imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, they enter and abide in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and bliss born of seclusion. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, they enter upon and abide in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied or sustained thought, with rapture and bliss born of concentration. Again, with the fading away as well of rapture, they abide in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, they enter upon and abide in the third jhana, that state on account of which the noble ones say, one has a pleasant abiding, the one who abides mindfully in equanimity. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, they enter upon and abide in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When the mind is concentrated thus, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of all imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs their knowledge to the recollection of past lives. One recollects manyfold past lives. That is, they recall one birth, two births, three past births, four past births, five births, ten births, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred births, a thousand prior births, a hundred thousand births, many kalpas of world contraction, many kalpas of world or universal expansion, many kalpas of world contraction and expansion. Knowing there I was so named, I was of such and such a clan, I had such and such an appearance, such and such was my nutriment, such and such was my experience of pleasure and pain, such was my span of life. And after passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was named so-and-so of such and such a clan, with such and such an appearance, with such as my nutriment, such as my experience of pleasure and pain, such was my lifespan. And passing away from there, I reappeared there. Thus, with their aspects and all their particulars, one recalls manyfold past lives. 
With the mind concentrated thus, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs the mind to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of other beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses regular human eyes, one sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. One understands, one understands how beings pass on according to their karmic actions thus. They know these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, give an effect to wrong view in their actions. On the dissolution of the body after death, they have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions. On the dissolution of the body after death, they've reappeared in a good destination, even in a heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses human eyes, one sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and they understand how beings pass on according to their karmic actions. And when the mind is concentrated thus, purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs the mind to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. One understands, as it actually is, this is suffering. They understand, as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. They understand, as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. And they understand, as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. They understand, as it actually is. These are the taints. They understand as it actually is. This is the origin of the taints. They understand as it actually is. This is the cessation of the taints. And they understand as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When one knows and sees thus, the mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. One understands. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming back to any state of being. This bhikkhus is called the kind of person who does not torment themselves or pursue the practice of torturing themselves and who does not torment others or pursue the practice of torturing others. The one who, since they torment neither themselves nor others, is here and now hungerless, extinguished, and cooled, and abides experiencing bliss, having themself become divine. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. So, we did the whole thing. Excellent. So, as I was saying, that where, you know, it starts at the section with a Tathagata appears in the world, Buddha appears in the world, or some Dharma falls into your world, you're a householder, 
you hear the Dharma, this idea of extinguishing your anxiety, stress, and suffering sounds good to you, and then you're on your way. And then this lays out the whole path. Notice that it begins with morality in that way, or I suppose you could say it begins with the leaving of the household life. Of course, this is one of the older Buddhist suttas that's still, of course, extolling the virtues of, of monasticism in that way. But regardless, the idea is, is that this lays out these, well, it lays out what is uh, required in a way. And what I mean is, is that you'll notice that there's always this section about morality first, abstaining from killing, stealing, lying, and all of that. And then once that's established, then we can move on to this idea of restraining the sense faculties. You know, when you see a visible form, not like glomming onto it and desiring it and getting all worked up about it, right? So that kind of restraint. <clears throat> but what we want to notice, <clears throat> excuse me, what we want to notice though, is that if I hadn't really worked on my morality in that sense, meaning if I were still really kind of covetously desireful of things to the point where I might steal them and angry to the point where I might harm or injure somebody else. So if I still have all of that going on, what do you think my relationship is going to be with my faculties and sense objects, right? It's going to be a complicated relationship with the sensory world. Whereas if you can get that stuff under control, the violence, the lying, the duplicity, all of that, if you get that under control, then you have a good strong foundation to then start restraining the sense faculties. Now, if you can successfully restrain the sense faculties as described, then you can develop this full bodily awareness that is described. And that full bodily awareness, of course, is very connected with the four foundations of mindfulness we talked about at the beginning. If you read the sutta on the four foundations of mindfulness, it will talk about cultivating that full bodily awareness. This is a, you know, gives a very good description of what that means in terms of, you know, full bodily awareness, no matter what you're doing in all of your movements. You are fully bodily aware inside and out in that sense. Now, that level of bodily awareness that in, like, can almost reach like inhuman levels in terms of like awareness of your own anatomy and awareness of your own, like how things are functioning within yourself. The idea, though, is, is that that level of bodily awareness only comes from the meditation, which can only be established if you have a good moral base in that way. But then those three sections, focusing on the morality, focusing on the meditation, then focusing on this bodily awareness, that puts you now in a position to go find a nice, quiet place to do the jhana practices. And the idea is, is that you're not getting anywhere near the first jhana unless your morality is under control, your, your relationship with your own sense faculties is under control, and your relationship with your own body is under control in that way. So I want to kind of really point out the way that this sutra lays this out. It's very about like that this is a foundation for this, which is a foundation for that, all the way up to the destruction of the taints. Questions, comments, answers, ideas, points of interest. Anything pop up for anybody? Is this the part for unmuting? Oh, uh, sure. And everybody here is, you know, good friends. Nobody's going to bomb us at this point. Um. 
Yeah. And I guess the one thing that I would want to mention that I think I could throw out there as an interesting sort of like just a something to talk about, perhaps. I would want to kind of point out that this sutta, it is sort of one of the suttas that's talking about the difference between a householder life and the monastic life. It's what the whole, that whole little thing with the elephant tamer, where he was like, hey, I'm busy, I got to go. And the Buddha's like, oh, that's too bad. That's too bad that you got to go because you'd probably really like this next part, right? So it kind of sets up how the householder, you know, only goes so far in that way. And then, oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't mention this. The sutta is a little ambiguous about um, Kandaraka. Like, so this sutra is called the Kandaraka Sutta. It is the sutta to Kandaraka. And so I think we are to understand that the white-robed lay devotee, the elephant tamer Pesa, he left. But I think we are to understand that Kandaraka stayed and basically got converted in that way. It doesn't say that, but I think we are to understand that that's what was going on with this. But regardless, the sutta is definitely sort of like encouraging leaving the household life in that way. And because I'm myself and much more of a Mahayana Bodhisattva type of Buddhist in that way, I kind of want us to look at this sutta and really ask ourselves, you know, does the Buddha actually say anything in the second half of the sutta that is not possible by a householder? Depends upon how you define householder, I suppose, in that way. But I just wanted to like kind of point out how even though the Buddha is basically saying, yeah, if you really want to do this, you have to like leave the householder life. I think that there's a way that it's not so much about whether you live in a house or not. And at least from the Mahayana point of view, celibacy is sort of, mm, you know, a complicated issue in that way. But I think what's really more like, I think what's really being said in this sutta is that when our elephant tamer friend is like, ah, I'm busy, I gotta go. I think the idea is, is that for Pessa, the elephant tamer, he's doing some Dharma and he's got some other things going on in his life. And so because he's got kind of a lot of stuff going on and he's busy, he can kind of only give so much to the Dharma. And so again, rather than this, like I would read this as it's not about whether you live in a house or not, or this and that, but it is about your focus and dedication to practice. That's how I would read it. And that to really accomplish the goals here, it's you, it's going to take more than just like a little 30 minute meditation timer a couple times a week kind of an idea. So I just kind of want to point that out as a possible way of avoiding, because um, I'm not, a, everybody knows I'm not monastic. I don't even promote monasticism in that way but I would still in a way promote this entire sutta in that sense. So any comments, questions about that? Yeah, Robin, please. That, um, that line about the tangle, that humans are tangled, is that sort of the same thing? Like uh, instead of focusing, instead of being able to um pull it all together it's you know i gotta have these other things to do yep yeah it's a it's a lovely line it's a lovely line and it is this um it's a lovely line it's also this beautiful or not beautiful it's kind of unfortunate but this sentiment about this oh the human has gotten himself in such a predicament such a tangle in that way <laughs> and then this idea of like that this whole sutta is about untangling that in that sense. And I think when I first read this and when I reread it earlier this week, I myself was definitely encouraged to notice because the Buddha talks about 
uh, us humans, you know, our bodies are doing one thing, we're saying another thing, and we're thinking another thing. I sort of have spent this last week kind of noticing my own when I am disparate like that, like when I notice that I'm moving in kind of three different directions, or when all three body, speech, and mind are in harmony in that way. So this sutta gave me, uh, definitely got me thinking about that and thinking about my own entanglement in that way. So. I had a, I had a question. Yeah. I, um, I guess the first part where you were saying you torture yourself mm. and there are parts of torturing yourself that, <laughs> that felt like are, are preached in Buddhism, right? Like, mm. um, not not eating meat or uh, even fasting sometimes. I, I, so I, I'm a little bit confused about that part because um, I feel like it's not. I feel like it's for health, right? In some some regard. Um, yep. So, yeah. Excellent question. Um, to to really go through all of those would be we'd be here a while. Right. <laughs> but let me. Um, <clears throat> I'll mention a few though. So. Like, for example, you mentioned the one about uh, not eating uh, fish and meat. Right. Like that was the way it was uh, phrased, right? Yep. <laughs> and what we would want to kind of recall or oh, keep sorry. in mind is that in this type of Buddhism, or at least in the Theravada tradition that would, you know, that would support this sutta, they are not vegetarian. The rule for the early monastic community was actually that whatever got put in your bowl, meat or not, you were to eat it because it was offered. So here the Buddha is saying that it was it's actually a form of, of um, unwise asceticism to refuse. You could read it that way. And what I'm what I'm getting at is that that doesn't contradict early Buddhist practice. Okay. If you think if you look at the ones about the clothing, uh, wearing all these different kinds of clothing, that too the Buddha said, yeah, don't do that. Just go get some rags, cut them up, and stitch it together. So a lot of the Buddhist uh, the middle path in that way in the original version doesn't do these things is my point okay but in the mahayana tradition where they do make it a rule not to eat meat but this sutra wouldn't in a way know about that okay so it would yeah. it would be an interesting question of how would a mahayana buddhist read this sutta right that, right that might be but th i want to make it clear that her like what well, you know hermeneutically speaking like within the context of this tradition this is consistent okay but i hear you though that for for us that are a little more maybe mahayana in that way we probably heard a few of those like you did and we're like but wait a minute <laughs> that's what i do like right right so am i, am I torturing myself you know i right. mean in, in some ways i also think of it it's almost like I, I reflected on them. I said, okay, if I was purely living in nature, you know, right. I would, I would not, you know, I wouldn't be torturing myself with diets and other things. I would just be like, yep. what's coming in my bowl is what I have to survive on. Yep. So I kind of interpreted it that way, but then I was like, uh, that maybe doesn't work with society now or something. So, yeah. There's a, there's a deeper comment to make here though. And it doesn't say it explicitly. It's sort of like the, the Dharma teacher in me sort of feels it. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is that, you know, the, the Buddhist prescription about, no, just beg for food and whatever gets in there is what you eat. Mm -hmm. it, if that approach to that, it takes the self out of it as far as like me doing something to, like me abstaining from this or me it's like, it's a very, it keeps the practitioner very neutral. The The clothing pro, pro, prohibitions are also about being kind of not, it's like, just don't worry about it. 
one way or the other. And I think the critique here about in a, an austere ascetic practitioner, they're kind of really obsessed with themselves. Mm. Like, if you know what yeah. I mean, and I think the yes. Buddha is critiquing that type of self-obsession. Yes, yes. Austerity. Yeah, I totally, I totally understand that in, in some ways. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. And on that note, I will call it a night. That'll be another sutta for the Dharma doors. Um, I hope you can come back next week. Well, we'll do another one. I'm not sure if it'll be the very next sutta. I'll look at it this week and see if it seems right for us. Otherwise, I will see you next Sunday night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>